Hi and welcome back to our look at electrolysis. We're going to look at the electrolysis of aqueous solutions today where we end up with a situation that we call competition at the electrodes. So you may remember when we looked at electrolysis we were doing the non-spontaneous reaction. Okay, so this is a reaction that requires chemical energy to be applied. We looked previously in our previous video at the electrolysis of molten solutions of ionic compounds, that being just solutions of sodium chloride that was in the liquid form or potassium bromide. So anything where we were looking at liquid, so heated until it became a liquid molt, molten salts. We had them in one container connected up to a power source and the electrolyte was just our molten salt. There was nothing else present in the cell. Sometimes in a chemical cell there is more than one thing present. There might be multiple salts or we might have an aqueous solution. This means we need to use our chemical electrochemical series to predict what would occur. We need to look at everything that is present in our cell, circle it on our electrochemical series, and then determine which is the strongest oxidant because that will react at the cathode undergoing reduction, and determine which is our strongest reductant because that will be what is reacting at the anode undergoing oxidation. Okay, remembering that the reductant is always oxidized, so will occur that reaction will occur at our anode, and the oxidant will always be reduced and will occur at the cathode. And so with this, we can look at aqueous solutions. <clears throat> if we consider a soluble salt of in an aqueous solution, we now end up with a situation that is more challenging to predict. Along with the ions that are present in solution, so if we say this was sodium chloride, we would end up with our chlorine on our electrochemical series at 1.36 which is going to be our Cl2 plus two electrons going to our two Cl minus. Okay, we would end up with sodium all the way down here where we will have our Na plus plus an electron going to sodium metal and that is never going to happen as long as we have water around and we know that because sodium is a highly reactive metal it will spontaneously react with water producing hydrogen gas and hydroxide okay and so we can't put a piece of sodium into water and not expect it to react so generally we are talking about sodium chloride so we would have na plus present and cl minus present but we will also have water present and if we look on our electrochemical series we will see there are a couple of equations for water one is going to come in just under chlorine which is actually one of our oxygen reactions that we looked at for fuel cells. So O2 plus 4H plus, okay, it plus four electrons is going to react to produce water. So here is one of our waters, okay. And then the other one, as we move down the electrochemical series, comes in just under zinc. And this is going to be for the reduction of water, where we get two H2O, and this is going to react with two electrons and we are going to produce H2 gas and OH minus. What you will see with this is that if we look at everything we have present in our cell, we have these two waters, we have Cl minus and we have Na plus. If I want to find the strongest oxidant, remembering that is in my top right hand corner, I'm going to go down until I hit the first thing that I've circled that is present in my cell, and that's actually going to be H2O. Okay, so this is my strongest oxidant, and then my strongest reductant is actually because this is my Na plus that I have. I don't actually have sodium metal. So my strongest reductant, I'm going to start on my bottom right hand corner 
run my finger up my electrochemical series until I hit the thing that I circled that is my strongest reductant in my cell. And then this reaction, when we apply the voltage, is the one that will occur. The non-spontaneous reaction, so the positive gradient from left to right. And what you can see is that the strongest oxidant is water and the strongest reductant is also water. So I will have O2 gas being produced and also have H2 gas being produced. Okay, so in this case, we are going to end up with a situation where we will have hydrogen gas being produced at the cathode and oxygen gas being produced at the anode. Okay, remembering that reduction always occurs at the cathode, so it, we're going to be seeing our reduction reaction occurring there and then oxidation at the anode. As you can see here, we will never produce sodium metal from the electrolysis of water. And under normal conditions, remembering standard conditions for our cell, we won't produce chlorine. If we change the conditions, what we start to see, and if we run this with sodium chloride in our water, we will actually start to smell the production of chlorine gas. Okay. And this is because if we increase the concentration of the salt, the chlorine gas now is going to compete at this electrode. Okay, so now we're going to, if we increase it to say brine, where we have a saturated solution of chloride ions, we're going to observe chlorine gas rather than oxygen gas. This allows us to produce a number of important chemicals such as chlorine that we use for polymer chemistry, bleach, hydrochloric acid, and various things like that. Okay, so this is an important reaction. But as you can see, we increase the concentration of the ions, and this happens with all halogens. We see a different reaction happening because of competition. This is because the E naught of chlorine and oxygen are quite close, and as we increase that concentration, there's more chloride ions around, so they just start, according to probability, reacting. This won't happen, though, for the sodium ions because of that reaction between sodium and water. The reduction potential for sodium is too low, and we're just not going to see it being reduced as long as water is present. We can see this also happening with competition when we use reactive electrodes. In the previous examples, we have only seen us looking at the reaction where we're using inert electrodes. And this is one of the reasons that we often use inert electrodes for um, electrolysis, because that non-spontaneous reaction, if we have electrodes that could possibly react, they will compete for the desired reaction at our electrodes. So if we look at this, we're looking at a cell that contains reactive electrodes. They need to be considered when we look at the strongest oxidant and the strongest reductant. Okay, so with this, if they are going to be reactive, they're going to be consumed as the cell operates. If we look at this example here, we have a positive uh, on our power supply and the negative. So this here is going to be our cathode as the electrolytic cell runs. This is going to be our anode. We have been told that we have one molar nickel sulfate solution and copper electrodes. So we go to our electrochemical series. We're going to remember that this solution is telling us that there is also water present. So we're going to find the relevant equations on our electrochemical series. I'm not going to worry about the sulfate. It doesn't appear on our electrochemical series. So going along our electrochemical series, the first one that we are going to hit is going to be for actually for um, copper, which is going to be Cu2+. plus. So we're going to be down around here. We're going to have our Cu2 plus to Cu solid reaction. Then we're going to keep moving down and we will see that the next one that we're going to see, be seeing is going to be our nickel. So we have 
nickel 2 plus. Going to nickel solid. And don't forget we need to look at those two waters. So we're going to have one of them down here. Our H2O going to H2 gas. And then just double check the um, presence of the other water, which is our one up the top, which is above copper. And this is our O2 plus 4H plus going to water. If we circle what we have present in the cell, we don't have copper 2 plus, we do have copper solid, we do have water, we have water here, and we have nickel 2 plus in solution. You will note here that the strongest oxidant is going to be nickel 2 plus, and the strongest reductant is actually going to be the copper solid. So we will see this reaction occur where we have nickel 2 plus plus two electrons going to nickel solid. And we will have copper 2 plus plus two electrons going to copper solid, but this one will occur in the reverse, okay? In this case, when we're looking at electrolysis, the higher one will actually be the oxidation reaction. So we will have copper solid going to copper 2 plus, plus two electrons at the anode, and nickel 2 plus, plus two electrons being reduced at the anode, sorry, the cathode, nickel solid at the cathode because this is our reduction reaction. Okay, so in this case, we get the desired product between nickel and copper, even though the water is present because nickel 2 plus is a stronger oxidant and copper solid is the strongest reductant. This is just looking at the electro electrochemical series, as you'll see in your booklet. So we can see here nickel 2 plus copper solid are the closer to on the electrochemical series. So that will be the reaction that we see. Okay, I want you to have a go at predicting what will happen in the products of this electrolysis, where we have one molar zinc sulfate, remembering that this is going to be ZnSO4, so we'll have Zn2 plus ions present, and now with copper electrodes at 25 degrees C. So this is telling us standard conditions. Copper electrodes, so Cu solid is present in our cell. We have Zn2 plus present in our cell and SO4 2 minus. We're going to ignore the sulfate. And because it's a solution, don't forget that we also have water present and to consider those two reactions. Well, hopefully you had a go and you realize when you look at the electrochemical series that even though water is present in this cell, that the copper solid and the zinc 2 plus ions actually fall within where both of our water equations are. So these are actually closer together. On this side we have Zn2 plus, and this side we have copper solid. Okay, so we will actually have this reaction occurring because zinc 2 plus is going to be our strongest oxidant present in the cell, and the copper solid is going to be our strongest reductant. So what we will actually see is Zn2 plus uh, being plated, going to Zn solid at the cathode with our two electrons. And we will have our copper solid actually being oxidized into copper two plus aqueous ions plus two electrons at the anode. So we would see the solution become more blue over time as we oxidized that copper. And this is the reverse reaction that we see in the Daniel cell where we see the galvanic cell producing energy. We're forcing the reverse reaction to occur where we're going to make the zinc solid, we're going to reduce the zinc and we will oxidize the copper. So when we compare galvanic or voltaic cells and electrolytic cells, which is something we can be expected to do in questions. Oxidation will always occur at the anode, but in a galvanic cell, this is going to be the negative electrode, whereas it will still occur in the anode in the electrolytic cell, but it will be the positive electrode. 
So the reverse is true for reduction. Reduction will always occur at the cathode. In a galvanic cell, it will be positive. In an electrolytic cell, it will be negative. A galvanic cell uses a spontaneous redox reaction that will generate voltage, whereas an electrolytic cell is going to use electrical energy to convert it back into chemical potential energy, forcing the reverse redox reaction to occur. So in a galvanic, we have an exothermic energy producing redox reaction in a voltaic, uh, in an electrolytic, sorry, it will be a endothermic reaction, that non-spontaneous reaction. We need to provide energy for it to occur. We also have our energy transformations, chemical potential energy into electrical energy for the galvanic or during the discharge of a secondary cell, whereas an electrolytic cell converts electrical energy into chemical energy, which is the same as what we see as the recharge process in a secondary cell. During discharge, we will have a positive cathode and a negative anode. And then during electrolysis, we will have a negative cathode and a positive anode. Galvanic cells, we need to keep the two half cells separate so that the reactants do not combine and we can uh, connect them via salt bridge and external circuit in order to complete the circuit. If the reactants combine, we get a direct redox reaction producing heat and we won't see electricity being produced because it's a spontaneous reaction. With an electrolytic cell, though, we see a single RIC container typically. Okay, and we will have a molten electrolyte or we will have an aqueous electrolyte. If we do have an aqueous electrolyte, we need to consider the competition at the electrode. 